So thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. I know it's been a long day and it's always a challenge to stay until the final event, but I think that we've got a very interesting dialogue to end the day. Of course, we have Qatari Foreign Minister Althani with us, who's going to answer our questions over the next half an hour. There's a lot to discuss. We've received some questions as well from our readers and uh, from, from some of you here. My name is Matthew Karnichnig. I'm the chief correspondent for Politico in Europe. And my colleague Declan Walsh from the New York Times, the Cairo bureau chief, is also here. And we welcome any input from you if you have any, any burning questions during the session. But I'd like to, first of all, welcome you and, and thank you for taking the time out to uh, answer our, our tough questions uh, this afternoon, sir. Uh, I would like to, to just jump right in it and come to the question of Yemen, which is something that has been, I think, top of mind for a lot of people in the region, and particularly this question of your country's relationship with Saudi Arabia, which we know has been quite difficult in recent years. There is some hope now in the United States that it can use the situation with the Khashoggi case and the, the leverage that the Trump administration feels that it might have on that front to create a, a kind of uh, unity uh, in, in the Gulf and, and some sort of reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And so my first question to you is, what do you think the scope of that is? Do you see any path to some kind of reconciliation with Saudi Arabia at the moment? Well, f first of all, uh, what's happened with the Khashoggi case is heartbreaking. And we believe that the international community is expecting the investigation to be concluded and the criminals to be held accountable. And for uh, uh, after this investigation is being concluded, we believe that there is a lot of reparation need to be done. We don't know yet if uh, the blockade against Qatar is one of, uh, one of those reparations, but none of these reparations is going to bring Khashoggi back to his family. Uh, if we are going to put uh, what's happened to us uh, in the GCC and the, the needless crisis which just started 18 months ago without any reasons. And uh, we will look at it, we have to look at the pattern of the Middle East in the last 18 months. The Middle East has gone from a worse situation to a much worse situation. So we have the blockade of Qatar, we have the problem with Lebanon, we have Syria and what's happening over there. We have Libya situation and it's still ongoing. We have the Yemen war, which has been catastrophic. And there is no accomplishment for anything over there. So we believe that the entire situation needs, needs a treatment. Our situation in the Middle East is, is, is really just going through chaos, from chaos to another chaos. We, we see some now, uh, some promises about Yemen that the war is going to be stopped. We, see a, we have seen a lot of pressure from the international community, especially from the United States, to stop the war. We welcomed the announcement yesterday by the Secretary of Defense to uh, stop the operation of Al-Hudaydah. We uh, need to see a proper engagement between the Yemeni peoples among themselves. And we don't want to see the external players taking advantage of this war and not to see any hope for any solution. We see that the people of Yemen are paying the price for what's, what's happening and what's ongoing uh, over there. The starvation level has reached to an unprecedented number. Any country who suffers from starvation by 20% by of its population, it's considered as a humanitarian disaster. In Yemen, it's more than 70%. The uh, issue of cholera and other diseases. And uh, the situation in, in Yemen needs a lot of attention, it needs a lot of treatment, uh, of, of treatment from the international community and needs a lot of help and support. And we hope that uh, we have chances now for this solution to happen. Do, do, do you think though that Saudi Arabia, given everything that's happened in Yemen recently, do, do you see that it has reached any of its objectives 
in this war? If we will take a flashback on, on the history uh, of the war of Yemen, why it started? It started for two main objectives. One is to restore the legitimate government back to Sana'a, and two is to, uh, to eliminate the security threat that Saudi has on their borders. None of these objectives have been achieved until now. And there are many people continuing to pay the price. The government are still exiled, and they have no influence uh, over any of, of, uh, of the territories, maybe just uh, uh, some of them. And uh, the, uh, the security threat has, been, has increased. Now we see the ballistic missiles not threatening the borders anymore. They are threatening the cities uh, in Saudi, which is also uh, a destabilizing factor for our region. So since these two objectives has not been achieved, what is the way forward? The only way forward is to bring the Yemeni people together around the table and to move ahead, stopping the war immediately and to move ahead with a peace process among them. But, but how likely do you think it is that Saudi Arabia at this stage will pull back? Well, uh, we see that there are some steps that are, are taken in response to uh, the international community request. And uh, they mentioned that they are going to have a cessation of, of, of the fights on, on Al Hudaybiyah, which is a starting point. But are you optimistic that the war will end? Well, we have to be optimistic. Uh, what, we need to, what we need to see, we need to see an actual uh, stop on the ground, that uh, the bombing stop, the war overall from all the parties, not from the Saudis only, but from the Houthis, from the different factions over there. We need to stop it and go immediately for the political solution. If I could jump in, Minister. Um, until last year, Qatar was part of the coalition that was fighting in the war in Yemen. It's a war now that internationally has become associated with a very grave humanitarian crisis, as you were saying. And also, there's a lot of disquiet about the high number of civilian casualties. Do you feel any regret that Qatar was a participant in the war until that point? No, we, we, we didn't regret to participate uh, as part of uh, the coalition which protect the Saudi security because uh, our mandate mainly was uh, on the Saudi border. We never participated in the ground uh, in Yemen, in, in, in the battlefield over there. But uh, we served the objective of the, when the coalition, the main objective of the coalition when it started, which is uh, eliminating the security threat and restoring the legitimate government. And those two main objectives are remain the same for Qatar. It's if the other parties or other countries of the coalition, they diverted from the objective, it's, it's, it's their choices. But our, our objectives remain the same. We don't want to see a security threat on Saudi and we don't want to see a security threat as well for the Yemeni people. For the, uh, certainly for the Saudis, they see the Houthis as a proxy force for Iran. Is that your view? Well, the Houthis are part of the Yemeni society. Whether uh, the Saudis like them or uh, any other country likes them or not, they have to accept them because they have to live together as part of the Yemeni society. The, uh, uh, the answer should be with the Yemeni people, the way they will uh, uh, come together to, agree to an agreement that they can live and coexist together. Uh, it's historically, uh, Yemen has a representation from different uh, backgrounds, and they've been living with each other for, for centuries. So why we now interpret it that those parties are proxy for this country or the other party is a proxy for another country? Well, they have received missiles. I mean, the UN inspectors have, and others have documented that they've received missiles and other munitions from the Iranians. For the Saudis, they say that's their principal security concern about the Houthi, about the Houthi presence, about the Houthi control in Sana'a. How, how do you feel about that? Definitely any, any security concern, uh, legitimate security concern by Saudi need to be taken seriously. And this is something no one can stop against. Uh, if they are, if they are receiving uh, support from different countries, such as Iran, this is a wrongdoing, and this is this is something which we don't want to see. This is something we need to, uh, we need to stop it immediately, as well as uh, the other party of the war. I didn't. Uh, I'm not talking exclusively about the coalition, and that the coalition need to stop the war. The war is between two parties, and both parties need to stop immediately. And this is what the international community have been calling for. What we are saying over here, that 
whether now uh, the Houthis are supported by Iran or supported by any other country, uh, the Houthis at the end, they are Yemenis. They need to come and to sit with their, uh, 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 with the people from the same country and to agree on what kind of future they will decide for themselves. Not, it's not us to decide their future. Of course, all, all of this is taking place against the backdrop of the, uh, the issue that probably concerns you most, which of course is the, the embargo against um, Qatar, which is now almost 18 months old. Um, for many uh, Qataris, I think they certainly saw this in very personal terms as an embargo that was the work of Prince Mohammed bin Salman and also the leaders from the UAE, but certainly Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who of course is now under huge international pressure because of the Khashoggi incident, the Khashoggi death. How have Qataris taken the, um, the news of Khashoggi's death? And do you think that the pressure that is now on Mohammed bin Salman will pressure him to take a more conciliatory approach towards Qatar, perhaps even talk, uh, end the embargo or put him under pressure to, to end at least parts of the embargo? Well, uh, the, case, the case of Khashoggi in itself, it's, uh, it's a barbaric crime. This will be condemned whether he's Saudi or he's from any other nationality and whoever the criminals are. And those criminals need to be held accountable for the crimes they, they have committed. Our, our view uh, on, our view on uh, the Saudis or the Emiratis and the way they decided on the embargo, this has been now for continuing for 18 months. We, uh, we still see them continuing with the same behavior, continuing uh, uh, not to be uh, responsive to any attempt by the international community to restore uh, this conflict. And we see that the conflict is still ongoing without any hope for, uh, for resolution. And we see the, continu the continuation of this uh, recklessness in dealing with the regional security, which is mainly starting from the Gulf. That sort of reminds me of the statement that President Trump put out a couple of days ago, which some people are referring to as, a, as his manifesto on, on foreign policy, where he gets into a lot of detail about the Kosoji case and his reason for apparently not pursuing further action against Saudi Arabia. What, what do you make of, of his statement and, and the reasoning behind it? Well, I'm quite sure that uh, President Trump, he, he based his statement based on the assessment which uh, came to him from uh, his agencies. And they are well, in fact, the CIA claims that Kasoji was, was murdered on orders of, of MBS. So, you know, Trump appears to have countervened that advice and is, is claiming basically at one point he said, well, it is what it is. And he's saying that these power politics at the end of the day are really the only thing that matters. Well, at the end, what, from our perspective, when, what needs to be done, that whoever uh, committed or responsible for this crime, he needs to be held accountable, whoever he is. Uh, whether m uh, Mr. Trump, uh, the president, uh, he have the final conclusion or, or not, we don't know. Uh, we don't know about it. But what the international community demands are the criminals to be held accountable, and this is very clear. We have to wait for the investigation to be concluded, and we see what are the measures going to be taken against the criminals. Um, sp sticking with President Trump for a moment, um, your own country's relationship with President Trump has followed a certain trajectory over the last 18 months. When the embargo started, he uh, came out very firmly on the side of your rivals. He called Qatar a, a funder of terrorism at a very high level. And then he met with the Emir in DC in April, and he said the Emir was a friend of mine. And your relationship has clearly taken a different turn since then. What changed? How did you do it? <laughs> well, actually, look, from the beginning, uh, when, when, you look, when you look at the tweets, we cannot judge the US policy based on, on a tweet. Uh, the entire estab establishment, the institutions over there, they were against the blockade. And they have called to end the blockade, to end the crisis immediately. 
and they have mentioned uh, Qatar, that Qatar is a strategic partner in the fight against terror. Uh, Qatar is an important ally for the United States. Uh, and this came out from the State Department, from the Department of Defense over there, and Department of Treasury as well. They, are, they have commended the work Qatar has done in, in, in the fight against terror financing. So the position of the president, maybe it was driven by misinformation by others, by, by the leaders of, of the blockading states. He, he was just coming back from Riyadh at that time. But at the end, we see that uh, uh, the truth will prevail. And this is what happened. This is what changed the position. Uh, I'm sure that his agencies uh, put for him uh, the truth and put for him the reports on the table and showed that Qatar has been uh, a strategic ally for the United States. We are hosting the U.S. base over there. The fight against terror starting from Doha. It's, 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 it's handled from Doha. It's commanded from Doha. How we are going to feed the two sides of the equation doesn't make sense even. And even the public opinion, they realized that it was a big propaganda campaign which was propagating by, by, by the blockading states. And uh, everybody realized that this is, this is untrue. And I mean, the veil have, has been un uncovered in, in, the, in the recent events and in, in what's happened, not with Qatar only, with uh, a lot of other countries, I mean, Germany, Canada, uh, others. The same methods are used against any countries who are opposing their policies. Have, have you told them, some of those countries, I told you so? Well, uh, we didn't. We, uh, we saw them experiencing this themselves. No. But Qatar does seem to be sort of straddling this divide at the moment between its alliance or its partnership with the United States on the one hand. Obviously, the U.S. has a very important base in your country and your relationship with Iran on the other. Who is the most or the more important partner for you at the moment? Definitely, U.S. is our most strategic and important ally for in, in, in Qatar and in the region, in the entire region. But with this, we cannot change geography. Iran is our neighbor. Iran is a country that we have to deal with as part of our region. We are sharing with them uh, our largest gas field. We have the only airspace which is open for the Qatari people to, uh, to go to fly is, is the Iranian airspace. Our supplies are coming uh, via Iranian ports, and they are part of, of this region. Now, there is a dispute between uh, the U.S. and Iran, and this is, for us, it's putting us in a situation that we see a, a, a disagreement between our uh, strongest ally and our neighbor, which is uh, uh, not a comfortable situation for any country, but at the end, we see that there should be uh, a way to bridge uh, this disagreement and to help in solving the problem. And if Qatar can provide this bridge, why not? Qatar has been a facilitator and mediator for different uh, adversaries. At the end, what we want, we want to see a stable region. We don't want to see a nuclear rain, uh, race. And we see that uh, geography cannot be changed by choice. It is something that, uh, we came and we found it. We found it as, as a reality. So we need to adopt to each other. We need to work on uh, uh, living with each other and the way how to coexist. Iran or any other country, uh, we are all interconnected. We have to look forward to how we can take our relation from differences and disagreement to more cooperative relationships. At the same time, you had the State Department, uh, um, Secretary Pompeo, which came out, I think, in September, and again has been promoting this idea of creating an Arab NATO um, that they see as an alliance of friendly countries, particularly in the Persian Gulf, which would uh, present a united front against Iran. Now, I know you have responded to that proposal by saying, look, the first problem we have is the embargo. But if you could, for a moment, set aside the embargo, um, and imagine a situation where that's not a stumbling block, wouldn't that create quite some difficulty for you at, for the same reasons you've just pointed out that, you know, you would be called by the United States to 
ally against Iran, and yet for reasons of geography and other immovable reasons, as you've just laid out, you need to maintain friendly relations with Iranians. Well, uh, being in, in alliance with, with the US, this is our situation right now, and this is the rest of, of uh, the GCC country's situation right now. But being in an alliance that's offensive against uh, another country, this is something that not Qatar uh, nor other countries also in the region would accept or would like to be in. And especially when this country is, 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 is a neighbor for us. Uh, the terms that dictated for our relationship between this country and my country are different than the terms which are uh, bit, uh, in, uh, dictated to the relationship between the US and, and this country. Or uh, the same thing applied to other countries in my region, Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, Oman, uh, UAE. All of them, they are living on, on, uh, on the shores of, of the Arabian Gulf and from the other side of the shore is Iran. And in your, and in your case, you share um, a very large gas field, the source of much of your country's wealth with Iran. Well, it's the largest gas field in the world. Um, can I just turn briefly to uh, another, uh, pivot to one other point. You mentioned Twitter a moment ago. Um, I was in Doha at the start of the, of the crisis and it struck me um, how much of it was playing out on social media. Um, I'm just wondering what is your sense of um, you know, how social media has influenced the tensions in the region between political leaders, and how, what sort of role social media is playing in the relations between ordinary people, between ordinary Qataris and Emiratis or Saudis as these, as, uh, against the backdrop of this political crisis? Well, uh, at the beginning of the crisis, the misuse of, of the social media, especially by the blockading states, I think everybody now has noticed and has read all these research, uh, the way they uh, conducted uh, the propaganda campaign they spread against Qatar, the way they tried to spread fears among the Qatari people, the way they, st they tried to uh, just uh, to change the perception and the image of Qatar uh, in the world, has uh, shown that uh, we have societies around us that uh, they don't know how to practice the freedom of speech responsibly. And they, don't, they didn't count and calculate the damage for them and for their reputation in the future. What had been done uh, over, uh, especially the first months of, of, of the blockade, been very damaging for the GCC reputation. Uh, we were like, uh, even when we are, we are traveling outside and we see uh, our friends and allies from different countries in the West, you see the amount and, and, and uh, the way, uh, uh, how, how those uh, you know, social media companies which were contracted by, by, the, by the blockading states, how they tried to to just to spread lies and to, to change the image of Qatar. We feel a shame on ourselves that to see that this is fed by our uh, neighbors, by, by countries which were in, in one day just uh, or a few months before this were our allies. That's all done like this. The role of social media, unfortunately, can be much better used for uh, positive change, not for a negative change to change uh, the mentality of the people toward openness, toward more uh, progressive and, and positive work, not toward hate and, and hating others and hating other countries. But when you see the, the, the conversations between ordinary Qataris and ordinary Saudis that unfold on social media away from the political realm, sometimes those have been quite ill-tempered too. Do, 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 you, do you see, are you worried about that social media is perhaps inflaming tensions between ordinary people in your countries? Well, in, in, in my country, uh, we, didn't, we didn't notice this. We see, yes, there are disagreements and there are sometimes, uh, they, are, they disagree among themselves in, in an aggressive manner, but uh, we didn't 
our people uh, and the culture they came from is, is different than the culture maybe the other countries, uh, the other people from uh, our neighbor's country they are, they are coming from. Because, uh, I mean, in, in Qatar, we adopted change 20 years ago. And people, they, they know, they understand that they're all different people who have different perspective. And they understand that they shouldn't uh, agree with them all the way. They can disagree with them. So it's, it's a bit different culture and it's a bit different mindset. I, I did want to come to an, another issue that you're asked often about on your, your travels around the world, which is uh, the, the, the World Cup and the scrutiny that your country has come under uh, for the labor practices surrounding the construction there. In fact, Angela Merkel, as I told you before we came up here, brought it up yesterday in a speech to the Bundestag in Berlin. Do you think that you have overcome the issues surrounding that? And how do you think the, the World Cup is going to end up uh, you know, helping Qatar and the region? Do you think that it is something that could end up bringing some of the countries in the region together and, and diffusing some of the tensions? Well, uh, the World Cup and the football itself, it's, it's a message of peace. It's, uh, it's a language, it's a religion that everybody can practice. Although it you has, yourself it are has, a football fan, as you say. Well, I'm not a football fan, but I'm, uh, I'm one person among uh, 2.6 million of population, and 300,000 of them are Qataris. So most of them, they are a football fan. I cannot judge the Qatari people on, on me personally only. And you are not a football I'm fan, not. As, well, as, I'm an American, as you told so me so. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, um, this is, this is our aim. From the beginning, we see that uh, this is a message of peace. This is a message that will bring a different image for the Arab world. It will uh, show that the Arab world can host a world-class event, can bring the people together, and can uh, uh, change the perspective, which is uh, on the West, about the Arabs. It's all war, it's all about, it's, it's all about conflict, it's all about... Uh, uh, extremism or whatever it is, that the Arab people, we have, we have youth who are football fans, who loves football, who, who are hospitable, that they can welcome their guests and they can uh, uh, be a, a very good example for the world to host, uh, to host such an event. Unfortunately, uh, what's happened now politically is uh, people are trying to take advantage off and trying to, to use it that this is not going to be a welcoming event for all the Arabs, but we state this very clearly. We have a clear China wall between this, the politics and anything else in the life of the people, whether it's a sport, whether it's culture, it's music, education, whatever it is. And this is something that Qatar never used. And uh, we see that also the World Cup will bring a good change for Qatar. And one among them is the labor reforms, uh, is one of the things which we are proud of that the World Cup brought to Qatar. Uh, we did a lot in the reforms of, of the labors, but always there's, there is still room of improvement. We know that uh, uh, the situation of the labors wasn't perfect at the beginning, but also the amount of work at the beginning of, before even uh, think about the, was the World Cup wasn't that much. Uh, and uh, wasn't in need for, uh, for all these uh, changes or, or changes that, or it's not bringing to the attention for the government that there is a big problem about it. And the World Cup projects brought this uh, to our attention and we made these ch changes happen. And now uh, the international organization are uh, looking at what Qatar has done, uh, uh, have been doing for, for the past few years, and they commanded all, uh, all the efforts uh, that Qatar has done. And they see that Qatar is, is a good example for change. And we s always say that the World Cup is a great example for changing countries. But in, in the spirit of that Arab fraternity, will you be inviting the Saudi leadership to Doha for the World Cup? Well, the Saudi people are welcome. The Saudi leadership, they want to come with their team. Of course, they will be welcome to come. Um, and, uh, their team will qualify. Yesterday, the, uh, the FIFA president, Gianni Infantino, gave an interview where he reiterated his wish that the World Cup in Qatar should be expanded from 32 to 48 teams. 
a, an arrangement that if it came to pass would potentially involve expanding the World Cup to include some of your neighbours like the Emirates. Um, he, he, he went in an interview yesterday, he said that maybe football is a way to build bridges. Is that right? Well, uh, football always is a way to, to build the bridges. And we, Qatar is ready to host the World Cup. Qatar is ready to... Uh, a 48 uh, uh, team World Cup? Well, I'm not a technical person in this, but I'm sure that Qatar can deliver the best World Cup ever. But if there is any room for cooperation and for uh, integration between the different countries, uh, we are always welcoming these ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Appreciate your time. Thank you.